The Andreasen Affair, the documented investigation of a woman's abduction aboard a UFO. Mr. Fowler, good morning. Good morning, Ben. Nice to be with you. Before we start talking primarily about the Andreasen Affair and about, uh, and about, and we listen to this tape, and I think you'll give us an introduction to that in a few minutes. How did one come from being a, a, UFO, a UFO military investigator with the Air Force to, uh, is it just a natural kind of sequence to continue this kind of work after the military? Well, really, uh, I was with the United States Air Force for a number of years, not as a UFO investigator. We were doing electronic espionage under the auspices of the National Security Agency. But within this position, uh, UFO reports uh, did come to my attention, which indicated that the United States Air Force was taking the subject very seriously indeed, which was one of the things that instigated me to look into the matter further when I got out of the service. So it just developed That's right. from that? Really, it developed from a, uh, a teenage interest in experimental aircraft. And when flying saucers became headline news, I thought that we were dealing with another experimental aircraft. But it didn't take very long to, for me and uh, the public to realize that uh, when you have all the major governments of the world investigating something, that something really must be going on. Well, now, for many, many years, and I think this is changing somewhat, though, but for many, many years, folks who considered themselves to be... Um, uh, I think objective investigators of UFO sightings were often referred to as the UFO buffs. That's right. And that was rather that wasn't considered too uh, uh, too nice uh, uh, in those particular times. Too nice phrase. The credibility, though, has changed, or at least uh, the credibility of the UFO investigator has changed tremendously, hasn't it? Yes, and I think this probably stems from the fact that uh, more and more scientifically trained people have become involved in UFO investigation. At the Manned Space Center, for example, we must have a couple hundred people who are interested in UFOs and some who are actively engaged in UFO investigation. Back in the 50s, when I was involved in this more or less as an interesting hobby, uh, people of that category probably uh, wouldn't uh, have anything to do with the subject. Even uh, astronaut uh, Gordon Cooper and astronaut James McDivitt are now coming out publicly uh, stating that they believe that UFOs are real. Cooper mm -hmm. says that UFOs are interplanetary, and he has recounted uh, several experiences that he has had with UFOs. They wouldn't have done that uh, several years ago. I think the credibility uh, is much higher. 57% of the American people right now, according to Gallup, uh, believe that UFOs are real and believe that they have uh, seen a UFO and that's 15 million people just in this country alone. How are you involved in John Fuller's incident at Exeter? I was involved as an investigator for the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena <clears throat> and conducted the initial investigation. John Fuller worked for Saturday Review at the time and was interested in UFOs and doing a story and contacted NICAP and asked what was new mm -hmm. and I was right in the process of this investigation and uh, he flew down and looked at my report and went back and reinvestigated what I had done and uh, wrote a very fascinating book. Yes, yes it was. If you would, give us background so we can lead up to what I understand is going to be a pretty startling piece of audio tape that we're going to be listening to. All right. The audio tape that you're going to be hearing excerpts from uh, comes from uh, one of 14 hypnotic regression sessions and uh, it concerns Betty Andreessen, who allegedly was abducted by UFO occupants and given, among many other things, a physical examination. What you're about to hear is a small segment of that physical examination, and I think that you will be able to relive with her the trauma and the pain uh, and the emotion that she experienced reliving this experience under hypnosis. And she is under hypnosis and recounting the re Reliving, not recounting. <laughs> Reliving. Okay. She's there. <clears throat> Listen. I was taking instruments. I was taking instruments. I was taking instruments. I was taking instruments. Why do you have to put that in my nose? I'm putting that thing in my nose and it's going up and it's breaking through something. I don't like it. Oh, and I can't move. It's hurting. I was pulling something, that needle again with a tube like on the end of pulling. Looks like he's pulling it. We 
apparently had a power failure, folks, and it really wasn't supposed to happen that way. That gets kind of spooky, doesn't it? You would have heard what happened on another TV station down oh, in Massachusetts. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> don't tell me this is <laughs> what happened. They had two independent tape systems down there uh, taping the TV program. When they played it back, about every third word was missing all the way through the show. And to the best of my knowledge, they still haven't found out what happened. You didn't arrange that. No, you didn't. I didn't arrange anything. <laughs> wow, what do you say now? All right, back in just a moment. We're going to start from the very beginning. We're going to let anything get us started. If you once you don't succeed, you try and try again. Unless you have another power failure, and then you get the message that time and go right on. But we're going to try it again from the very beginning. This is Betty Andreessen, uh, reliving under hypnosis a, um, a medical exam that, uh, well, I'm going to use the word, allegedly occurred aboard a spacecraft. Uh, I might go a, a little step ahead before we, before we play the tape. You see, the conclusion of the report has been that Betty and her daughter were both telling the truth. Something happened to them. Yes, uh, they both believe it happened to them. There's no doubt. The uh, lie detector tests, a uh, very rigid character reference check, and a number of other things that we can go into later indicates that they're telling the truth as they know it to be. Okay, once again, Betty Andreessen, under hypnosis, reliving that medical exam. I'm taking the instrument. How did you get involved in, first of all, investigating the case? Being with NICAP, you were called in? Well, actually not NICAP. I'm director of investigations on the board of directors of the Mutual UFO Network headquartered in Seguin, Texas. Uh, it happened in Massachusetts. I reside in Massachusetts. And the state director uh, told me of the case, and I became involved uh, with the investigating team, which consisted of an aerospace engineer, a solar physicist, an electrical engineer, and communications specialist and myself. There were five of us, and we were constantly checking each other as we've gone through, and a professional hypnotist. We also engaged the services of a professional psychiatrist. Uh, the investigation started in January of 1977 and continued for a full year, and the final report uh, consisted of uh, 528 pages, three volumes, uh, thoroughly documenting this close encounter of the third kind, type G, which involves an onboard experience. In your personal recollection, did indeed uh, what Betty Andreessen described during that hypnotic session actually occur to her? I believe that probably most of it did. We can't prove that. And why I say that is, uh, well, first of all, we know they believe it happened. They relived it as a real experience. Uh, Becky, her daughter, relived it from her own vantage point. Uh, th three uh, persons consciously remember the uh, initial part of the experience, the father and the daughter and, uh, and Betty. Uh, I think it's interesting that you can go back to January 25th, 1967 and check things like the weather, the power failure, how much snow was on the ground, what was on TV and things like that. We were able to do all kinds of checks like that, which indicated that they really were describing January 25th, 1967. What interests me the most is, though, that we have about 200 cases on file very similar to the Andreessen affair. And there are subtle similarities which exist between these cases which we feel no way some of these witnesses could have known about. And for uh, example? 
the needle, for example, that was inserted uh, in Betty's nose, uh, when they pulled that needle out, there was a little BB-like ball on the end of it. We know of one case that has never been published that has a similar thing happen during the uh, physical examination. Her description of the humanoids, uh, very similar to the Hills case. I think of a master sergeant who belongs to the human rope. Uh, I don't know what, where we're getting all these power failures, as a matter of fact. But, uh, in August of 1965, who had a very similar experience to Betty Andreas and his description of the craft, the occupants, how they moved or floated and so forth is very consistent with what Betty and others reported. Now, in the case of the master sergeant, uh, he belongs to the Human Reliability Program, which is a select group uh, within the United States Air Force. They have to pass a battery of psychiatric examinations to the cream of the crop. So there was no possibility of uh, psychosis as a, a very intelligent man. Mm -hmm. In the case of Betty Andreessen, you have a little country girl that has no knowledge of UFO. She had 10 years of uh, education, uh, married the boy next door, raised seven kids one after the other, and her life was mainly tied up bringing up children within the context of the local church, and uh, uh, she was interested in art. As far as UFOs went, she didn't even know what a UFO was, and if you told her what a UFO was, it would be really, uh, I, I suppose, against her religious beliefs to even believe that UFOs existed. We have an awful time trying to convince her that hypnosis was something that was legitimate and could be used by surgeons and dentists, uh, criminologists, and so forth. Uh, so we, we have a, we're a case where we have someone who had, had no background in UFOs and yet describes the same type of thing as other types of people from various walks of life have described in this country and abroad, which makes it very interesting. What was the reaction of Betty Andreessen when you first approached her to investigate her experience? Was she, uh, was she a little bit, uh, I suppose, skeptical of you folks? Yes, she had a lot of questions. Uh, we originally came to know about the incident because uh, she had written a letter to Dr. Jalen Hynek out of the Center for UFO Studies in response to a newspaper article which indicated that he was interested in cases of this nature. Unfortunately, all she could remember was the f flashing lights, which I guess we never really went over the story, but there were uh, flashing lights in the backyard, a local power blackout, interestingly enough, <laughs> and uh, these beings somehow getting into the house, the father saw them out in the yard coming toward the house, uh, but it was so vague that Dr. Heineck uh, just filed it away for a few years, and uh, we uh, came to know about it in 1977. But she was very this interested. This 20 years then after the fact. No, it happened on January, January 25th, 1967. And oh, we started in January of 1977. I thought you said 57. But she was very relieved that someone might be able to help uh, her discover what had happened. Uh, unfortunately, as she began to relive this under hypnosis and it came to a conscious mind, she thought she was going to be lo she was losing her mind. These things don't happen. And uh, we killed two birds with one stone. We, we had her uh, sit. Uh, with a psychiatrist to assure her that she wasn't a psychotic. She felt that she must need mental, medical attention because things like this don't happen, but also to assure us that we weren't dealing with, with a psychotic. Let me interrupt you. We'll continue our discussion right after news from CBS. You stand by, won't you? You know, when uh, Project Blue Book uh, was was closed officially, so to speak, by the Air Force. They made the statement that they were able to pretty well discount. I forget the exact figure. 95, 98 percent of all uh, of all sightings or reports, they were able to explain them. But it left that two or three percent. Uh, among the two or three percent, would you include in this the Andreasen affair? Uh, yes, I would, but the two or three percent is a very, very low figure. Uh, Dr. Heineck, who is chief scientific consultant to Project Sign Grudge and Blue Book, has indicated that the true percentage was uh, somewhere around 20 percent and uh, I think this came across very clearly in the movie, uh, the TV movie on uh, Project Blue Book that uh, was shown for maybe, maybe a year or so and they indicated a high percentage is 20 percent. Other countries, UFO projects also come up with this uh, 20 percent of the, which remain unexplained after, in, uh, after investigation. Just because you report, someone reports a UFO doesn't make it a UFO, it yes. only remains a UFO after investigation. Uh, can't find an explanation. Before we go to our phones, how about explaining to the listeners, and to me too for that matter, what exactly happened to Betty and Becky Andreessen on January 25th of 67? Okay, on that particular evening, about 6.35 p.m., uh, there was an intermittent power failure. Simultaneous with that, there was a flashing orange light which came uh, through the kitchen window, which overlooks a huge field. Uh, the
the children were scared. Uh, Mrs. Andreasen shooed her seven children into the living room, and uh, she had her parents staying with her to take care of the children because her husband was in the hospital at the time. Her father ran to the kitchen window and looked out and claimed he saw what looked like children dressed in strange Halloween costumes. This is what his description of these beings were uh, coming toward the house. Uh, on second look, though, he saw that they weren't walking, but they were moving, floating with a hopping motion. All he can remember after that is them somehow getting in the house. They did enter the house. Mrs. Andreasen communicated with them uh, through mental telepathy. Other members of the family seemed to have just frozen in motion, for want of a better term. We called it, we called it suspended animation. Mrs. Andreasen was very concerned about her family, and they allowed Becky Andreasen, she was 11 years old at the time, to come out of this state of suspended animation uh, to assure Mrs. Andreasen that she was all right. Under hypnosis, uh, Becky lives this uh, uh, portion of the experience very vividly, uh, describing uh, as an 11-year-old, she talked like an 11-year-old under hypnosis, used an 11-year-old's vocabulary, described the little clay creatures or men rather talking to her mother. Uh, and then, uh, to make a long story short, they convinced Betty Andreasen to follow uh, them to a craft which was out in the backyard. She felt that she had free will, but uh, looking back, hindsight, felt that they had complete control over everything that she did. The craft was very small. Uh, they stayed in that craft for uh, a fairly long time. She felt heaviness and so forth, and then it stopped, and she felt that she was taken aboard a larger craft where she was subjected to the effects of a number of very, very strange instruments. Uh, and then she was brought to an alien place where she had more experiences and then brought back uh, to the craft and returned to her home. Uh, it's a fascinating story. I think the Andreasen affair probably is the most documented uh, account of its kind. One of the interesting things about the Andreasen affair is we have a woman who uh, is an excellent amateur artist and she was given post-hypnotic suggestion to remember these things in detail after each hypnotic regression session and she was able to supply us with a chronological account with her drawings in, in great detail. Uh, most of which, uh, the major ones, are in included uh, in the book. Uh, one of the interesting things, though, uh, concerning the case, which I failed to mention before, is that uh, one of the investigators was an aerospace engineer, and uh, he uh, asked Mrs. Andreasen to describe uh, each segment of the craft that she was in, how she entered that room and how she left the room, what the dimensions were, uh, and then he took all of this information aside and was able to come up with a logical, very coherent, circular-shaped craft, which really amazed him. Uh, he was uh, very skeptical about this whole thing at first. And that sort of convinced him that there might be some legitimacy to the, the case. How long a period or, or time frame now did this take place? And did the rest of the family remain in this state of suspended animation while uh, Betty and Becky were wherever it was they went to? Well, it started approximately 6.35. They returned to the house at 10.40, and we estimate probably the uh, aliens left probably between 10.40 and 11 o'clock, probably close to maybe quarter 11, 11 o'clock. So the abduction experience, we feel, is about 3 hours and 40 minutes. The whole experience, maybe 4 hours and a half. Any thoughts, any ideas on was she indeed transported in that vehicle somewhere? It would uh, seem to be that that's the apparent stimulus. Uh, we can't prove that. Uh, all we can say is that what she described aboard the craft, what she described during the physical examination, uh, has been described uh, by others from various walks of life in this country and abroad who essentially describe similar things, uh, some of which she wouldn't have been aware of uh, at all. It's hard to prove something like this. It's, you have to use the tools that you do have uh, lie detector tests, uh, character reference checks. Uh, the same way you deal with a criminal case, it's, you don't have physical uh, evidence of uh, any kind for something like this. Almost nine years went by before uh, Betty Andreasen ever mentioned this to anyone, didn't it? They discussed it uh, within the context of their own family. She did discuss it with her sister. And uh, she, uh, not knowing that much about UFOs, was trying to explain it within the context of her uh, very simple uh, Christian faith, really, and she found nothing that really gave her any answers, and, and strange things that which she couldn't remember had happened to her, but they were just flashbacks of things that uh, had happened, but she couldn't hold it in her mind until this hypnotic regression uh, uh, 
situation took place. Back in just a moment. Now, let's go to our long distance line. In long distance, where are you calling from? Nobody there? Phones all the best, too? Well, I can't understand what you're saying to me. What does that mean? You're shaking your head no. Drop it. Put it on hold. Now what? Okay, we'll go up here and find out. Good morning, you're on KTRH. Hello? Yes. Hello there. Hello there. I hear somebody. Well, we'll get it, we'll get it straightened out and we'll figure out what's wrong with our phones and our power. <laughs> you didn't bring this with you, did you? Who knows what I brought with me? <laughs> Back in a moment. We're going to try it one more time now to the long distance line. And long distance, where are you? Hello. Yes. Louisiana. All right, Louisiana, go ahead. This is spooky. <clears throat> I'm getting a little spooky. No, please, good morning. I'm listening to your show this morning with great interest. I would like to ask Mr. Fowler a couple questions. One is about a kind of siding, if he's ever heard of this. Um... Sort of, uh, on a very clear day, a sunny day, not a cloud in the sky, uh, what would look like maybe a white cloud just moving across the sky slowly, and then all of a sudden appear in this like a swarm of what looked like either birds, but couldn't have been birds, it was too high, or maybe in the shape of airplanes. Now, I know you couldn't have a swarm of airplanes, but a very peculiar uh, cloud-like formation, and then suddenly disappear, just vanish completely. Have you ever heard of anything like this? Has anyone? Did the cloud disappear and the objects disappear, or the just? The whole thing, it was like looking, it was transparent. Well, the only type of case which I can think that might uh, be similar to that would be the type, what we call a type two uh, B case, where you have an object that's shaped like a cylinder, uh, surrounded with a cloudy uh, substance. Uh, usually it goes into a vertical mode and smaller objects uh, come out of the top or bottom of this uh, object and streak off in various directions. And then it goes back to a horizontal mode and, and moves off. So this, this, uh, nothing like this other than what, what out of a clear, solid blue sky, not a cloud, appear a white cloud and then would clear up and you could see like a swarm of uh, objects in there, white, absolutely white, and then all of a sudden just vanish and be looking again at the blue sky. Now, we thought maybe this were, were birds, like the egrets are, are often appear to be white, silver white in the sky. And maybe flapping their wings would have given a different uh, shadow, but they would just disappear completely. I was just curious to see. Uh, this happened over Lafayette uh, just a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Sounds very interesting. We have had uh, reports like that where something has materialized, again with the smaller objects, but not just disappearing all of a sudden, unless you happen to blink your eye when everything just moved off very, very fast. But uh, We were testing every morning. I would say, what do you see? Is it a, do you see it now, or has it disappeared? And uh, we're two very solid people. I mean, we just, you know, um, uh, uh, there was no hysteria. There was just, just an ordinary day riding in a car when this was seen. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly would have investigated that and looked into it a little bit if uh, you had reported it at the time and were able to supply the, the date and the time and place to our local people. What was your second question? Uh, the second one was, um, can you say something about mentally, telepathically, um, someone being impressed with a face? Now, this is not in the mind's eye it, or uh, uh, an imagination sort of thing, but like on a screen flash, a person, a face of a person, and being told or made to know, uh, I am from a, now this, this sounds so strange, but I, I'm from a UFO, I'm from, ex, I'm extraterrestrial, I am a visitor, and only that, but it's totally telepathically and not an imagination sort of thing, but like on a screen, the mind screen. I'm not a parapsychologist, but uh, being involved in UFO investigation, I've come across reports uh, uh, similar to that, but uh, uh, I really can't comment intelligently on something like that because uh, I'm not a parapsychologist. Are you objective in your investigation? 
I believe we are. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm probably acknowledged as probably one of the most objective uh, investigators in the United States, and I think my uh, buddies who saw me produce this book wondered if uh, I had uh, lost all sense of objectivity. And I'm really going on a limb, really, as far as my reputation goes, in, in bringing this, uh, this book, The Andreasen Affair, out. Uh, as I mentioned before, we decided this was uh, too strange to have just one person investigate it. We had a team of five, and most of this team of five are engaged in scientific research and engineering research uh, within the civilian, civilian scientific community and are really objective people. All five investigators in their initial individual evaluations in this 528-page report indicated that they believe that the Andreasen affair uh, involved people who were telling the truth, who knew it to be, and that there was a real experience there. It was a sign that something really is happening to these people, especially since uh, other cases exist similar to this. If this was just a unique case, I wouldn't be interested. But you did not go all the way to the point, or all, all the investigators are saying that, yes, Betty Andreasen and Becky Andreasen did have a close encounter of the third type, of the third kind. Yes, whatever that is. It's a close encounter of the third kind, type G. Now, the apparent stimulus for something like that is obviously extraterrestrial, but to accept the extraterrestrial hypothesis without physical proof would be non-scientific. We brought to bear upon the case those tools which are used by the criminologists. It's a type of evidence, if you will, that probably could uh, send a man to jail. Uh, eyewitness testimony, character reference checks, lie detector tests, hypnotic regression, and uh, other types of tests that were used, psychiatric examinations. We brought to bear upon the case uh, what we could, almost like a detective trying to solve a mystery. But when you get right down uh, to brass tacks, as it were, you need physical evidence to say without a shadow of a doubt uh, that this was a close encounter of the third kind, type G, which involved real extraterrestrial beings and a real abduction. How do you go about proving something like this? Know. That's what I want to explore yeah. with you in right. just a moment. I ask you, explore with you this possibility of proving beyond a shadow of a doubt what has occurred. If indeed this sort of visitation did happen, it would seem that somewhere that the, that the amount of evidence that you could develop, either in terms of evidence of a, uh, of a spaceship landing, evidence of, well, let's talk about maybe some of the unrealistic or realistic things. If all of these creatures did appear in the home, maybe they left a wrist watch or something behind, or something of this nature, uh, radar sightings uh, or whatever. And I'm sure you've gone through all of these, too. Yeah, let's, let's just comment on... Uh a different type of case, a close encounter of the third kind, which involves not only occupants being seen, close encounters of the third kind of a variety of this, these type of cases, a type G is uh, where a person allegedly has communication with occupants on board a UFO. But let's take a close encounter of the third kind, which is also a close encounter of the second kind, where there's physical evidence. And let's pick one out of the files of the United States Air Force's uh, Project Blue Book. On April 24th, 1964, uh, Lonnie Zamora, a policeman, was chasing a speeding car on South Park Street at Socorro, New Mexico. He saw a silver object descending rapidly out of the sky uh, near a dynamite shack and a loud roaring sound. His first thought was that the dynamite shack had blown up. He uh, broke off his chase, radioed headquarters, and told them that he was going to investigate. He proceeded toward the dynamite shack and stopped on a hill and looked down into a gully and there was an oval craft with what he described as two childlike figures in coveralls uh, examining the object. He thought it must be a car that has overturned or something. He still couldn't accept what he saw. He radioed to headquarters and asked for backup and continued down into the gully where he lost sight of the object, got up on another hill just above the gully and got out of the cruiser and advanced within 100 feet of that object. The occupants were gone. There was a roaring sound, and the object lifted off the ground with sort of a very, very blue uh, flame or plasma-like uh, material coming out of the bottom. And then that stopped, and that roar stopped, uh, and it just sat there motionless about 15 feet above the ground. And then it moved off with a strange up-and-down motion and out of sight. Uh, he tried by the way, when he first saw it, to contact headquarters by radio, and his radio would not work. Moments later, the state police arrived. They went down into the area and uh, found 
uh, four impressions and a series of burnt areas where the object appeared uh, to have come in and then left. Uh, they notify the Air Force. The Air Force uh, investigated. They found by means of a penetrometer that it would have been at least one ton of weight on each one of those indentations. Uh, the heat was tremendous. It cracked rocks. Uh, a total of 13 witnesses were found that either saw or heard this particular object. The United States Air Force still has classified this sighting as that of an unknown vehicle. Now, this is typical of other cases like this. The only difference between this type of case and the Andreasen affair case is that Lonnie Zamora didn't talk to these beings and uh, was not brought aboard. So it would seem that close encounters of the third kind, Type G, could be a logical extension of a type of UFO experience which has left physical data behind. Now, what is it going to take then? What sort of information or evidence is going to be necessary to make uh, or to or to bring this out of the uh, out of the realm of uh, to some people fantasy and make it uh, unmistakably fact? I think admission on the part of the government that uh, solid evidence does exist. I'm not sure they know what they're dealing with. I'm sure that they know that they're dealing with unknown vehicles from an unknown source, which they have no control over whatsoever. One of the interesting things that has come to light within the past few weeks is a summary report from the government of France to the Center for UFO Studies. Dr. Claude Poyer, uh, a director of a civilian French government-sponsored UFO project, is on our board of directors. In 1977, the French government seemingly took the UFO problem, at least partially, out of the hands of the military and commissioned a... Uh, commissioned uh, a, 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 a team of scientists to look at 11 close encounters of the third kind, one of which involved occupants uh, and communication. They spent the year of 1978 looking at these particular cases. The Center for UFO Studies received uh, several weeks ago a summary of a five-volume report, uh, which is still classified uh, secret, that indicates that, and this is the conclusion of the report, Ten out of the eleven cases uh, were found not to be misinterpretation of natural phenomena or misidentification of man-made devices, uh, nor were they hoaxes. And the conclusion of this study of these eleven cases indicated a very strong statement. Behind the UFO phenomenon, there exists a flying machine whose mode of sustenance and propulsion is currently beyond the scope of current uh, present-day uh, science. Uh, Originally, when that project was set up, Dr. Claude Poyer indicated that the results of this project would be made public, that the uh, five-volume report would be sent to uh, people uh, in this country and abroad to study, but the French government has classified this secret, and we don't know when the full results of this particular uh, uh, study will be made public, except for the summary report that was released to the Center of UFO Studies. So I think it's going to take something like uh, the government to release the information that is presently holding on UFOs to at least convince the public that UFOs are real, although the last Gallup poll uh, indicates that 57% uh, of the American people believe that UFOs are real and that they have seen a UFO. That's about 15 million Americans. Uh, from time to time, through the Freedom of Information Act, we've acquired some very spectacular military reports involving radar visual sightings, uh, weapon systems control panels being disrupted, uh, smaller missiles being fired from larger UFOs at uh, interceptors, uh, causing uh, disruption of navigational equipment, communications equipment. You read these things and you read these twixes, they're addressed to the White House, the Secretary of the State, Defense, all the heads of the intelligence agencies, Joint Chiefs of Staffs. Something is going on somewhere and uh, these twixes, uh, telegra telegrams, classified uh, telegrams, uh, contain some very, very hard information. And we've been very fortunate to have uh, got uh, information like that into our hands. Morning, you're on KTRH. Okay, outside of being totally frightened, I have a couple questions. All right, go ahead. What does a person do? Uh, are we just totally helpless? Well, if you see something like that, do you run? Do you submit? Uh, since the government has really not recognized that this exists as far as protecting the citizen of, uh, of the world, uh, what are we supposed to do? You're supposed to walk around thinking any minute you're going to get picked up? I don't want to live that type of life, even though I do believe this, is, has, this does exist. Uh, has there been any 
study as far as how you react if you're caught in this type of situation. What I don't know. I, if, I, if I were you, though, I don't think I would dwell on it and worry about it. That's for sure. That's not going to cause you all kind of problems. However, we were talking during the break that it seemed to me that the kind of evidence that it was going to take to really convince, well, even me and a lot of other people, would be the classic kind of take-me-to-your-leader kind of uh, experience. And you were telling me that the government has already initiated a study on just how to, how to approach that kind of a potential problem, haven't it? I was nearly wanting coordinator for the University of Colorado uh, UFO study sponsored by the United States Air Force. And uh, during an investigation, uh, we had two scientists uh, fly out to my home to investigate some very strange UFO sightings that occurred in Massachusetts. And at that time, they told me that uh, part of their job was to ascertain what would the government do if a UFO uh, landed on the White House lawn, for example. Interestingly enough, the Condon report never uh, contained any such report at all. Uh, one wonders uh, how many other reports that went to the University of Colorado never got printed. One of the reports, for example, that we investigated involved two trained observers, uh, former aircraft spotters uh, and amateur astronomers uh, using binoculars and a telescope and naked eye uh, signaling to a UFO with a flashlight. And uh, they were, the scientists were very intrigued with this report and put some credence in it, but it never appeared in the final report. And there are a lot of reports like that that never appeared in the final report. Have there ever been instances of uh, the... Uh of the uh, re of the accounts and of the sightings that remain, let's say, still classified as unknown, uh, where host uh, where hostile action was uh, in encountered on part of the UFO. There have been some cases, uh, for example, uh, at Otis Air Force Base, for example, in May of 1953, we have a master sergeant who was involved uh, in. Uh, uh, search for uh, a missing aircraft, which told us, who told us, a very interesting story. Uh, ground radar had picked up uh, unidentified flying objects off the coast of uh, Boston, and they sent uh, F-94C all-weather uh, jet interceptor to look into the situation. The interceptor took off and was over the gunnery range, and all communication navigational systems went dead, and then the aircraft engine cut out, and uh, the pilot uh, ejected the uh, canopy, cockpit canopy, and ejected himself, thinking the radar operator would follow suit. And uh, he, his parachute opened just in time. And he, there was no crash. He couldn't figure everything. was very, very quiet, and he landed. And uh, he went to the nearest house and knocked on the door and called the Air Force Base and uh, told them what happened. Uh, they found the canopy over the uh, weapons range. They didn't find the aircraft. They didn't find the uh, radar operator. He said that the mother came out there and spent three months living off base hoping to find uh, her son. He said there's no way that that thing could have kept on going out to the ocean, which was uh, you know, several miles off. He says it was falling like lead. There was, there was just no way that the plane completely disappeared. Now, there are a number of planes that have disappeared, uh, all crashed, chasing UFOs. Uh, and uh, if you consider this hostility, uh, I really don't know. The, there was one report that uh, these are in the minority, but let me give you an example of a little boy in Bealesville, Ohio, who went out to get some water with a metal bucket. And returning to his house, uh, he saw this typical oval UFO hovering at treetop level, and a ball of fire uh, seemed to come out, emanate from it, and, and come after him. And he began running, and the ball of fire hit him and knocked him to the ground. And his clothes, his outer coat, caught fire, and his he, he caught fire really. Uh, the grandmother uh, and the mother heard him screaming and came out and watched this boy, uh, saw this boy uh, rolling over and over. They went out they saw the object. There was a local power failure, which only lasted uh, about uh, 30 seconds to a minute. They managed to put the fire out, and they called the sheriff. He informed NICAP and the Air Force, and the boy was brought to the hospital and treated for minor burns. Uh, now, what... What do we make of this? Is this hostile action, or was that metal bucket, that metal bucket that he was carrying, initiate some type of uh, protective action on part of the UFO? The sheriff was convinced it wasn't a hoax, uh, but these cases in the mi are in the minority, and they might be akin to some native who has never seen an airplane before, watch an airplane land in the jungle, and the occupants leave the uh, airplane, but they leave the propeller going, and the native goes walking up to the airplane and sticks his head in the propeller, and then uh, his buddies. Uh, Blame it on the airmen. Now, who knows what, what what's going on here?